Well, hello. I'm so delighted to be here at Petal and Pitchfork Farm in Paulsbo, Washington, and Stacy Marshall, the proprietress, owner, flower farmer, and CEO, has uh, invited me to come meet her in person again and her special guest, and Rachel Wardley of Tallulah Rose Flower School is here, all the way from Cumbria, England. Hi, Rachel. Hi. I hope I gave those introductions correctly. You mm -hmm. did. It's great. Perfect. We're recording outside. And first of all, you two have been very busy for a week. And Stacey, why don't you just give us a little snapshot of what you have uh, just wrapped up. And then um, we'll have Rachel describe what is Tallulah Rose, and then we'll go into I'll dive deeper into both of your stories yeah well so first of all thank you for having us the slow flower movement um, and your pioneer work in that is incredibly important to me so I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity um, so so the the what I do here um, so I am in my eighth year um, as a commercial cut flower farmer um, I have been growing for nearly three decades as a hobbyist, um, cut flower gardens, perennial gardens. And I was actually, when we moved here in um, early 2017, it was that summer, I was sitting out on a bench in the pasture with my good friend Anne Lovejoy. And she said to me, you know, you've talked about growing flowers commercially. I just read an article in Seattle Times about this woman, Erin, and oh. you might want to check out her course. And so um, just a few months after that, I took the Florette um, online uh, cut flower course and um, became a graduate of that and learned a lot about um, growing at scale and learned a lot about um, growing commercially um, how to use certain infrastructure to grow at that scale. Um, so over the course of the last few years, we have explored a number of different models. So we have had you pick events um, for several years and for five years uh, ending this spring, I had a CSA subscription and I enjoyed and loved those clients very much. Um, and have slowly shifted into event works, special orders, and um, florals for weddings. And love that work very much because it has been a dream of mine to take seeds, corms, tubers, um, all the way through to design. It's really meaningful for me. I, I become in relationship with the flower and with the plant, and to see it through to that manifestation is really important. And so that's where um, Rachel has come into my life in such a, a powerful and impactful way because I, as a grower, never afforded my time, myself time, I didn't have time, to take a formal um, design course. And um, I'm going to let her take it from here, <laughs> but the experience that I have had this last week has truly been life-changing, and I'm not the only person um, who is now a, grad a Tallulah graduate um, who has said that. Well, I'm, that's a very nice handoff. We'll come back to you, Stacey, because I have lots of questions, and we have just toured your farm, a, a quick tour, but I have a I'm hoping to get one of those drone shots. I think that would really show the lay of the land. So Rachel, I want to hear about your journey from floral designer to educator and how you started your school and um, will ultimately land on how you came here. Okay. Um, so yeah, I was a floral designer. I used to have a, a shop in Bath. So I did lots of uh, the usual kind of florist services, love weddings, um, got into that uh, in a big way, was doing a lot of weddings, almost too many weddings, mm. really, um, but loved it. And as part of that business model, I used to do um, very small workshops. So I had quite a small studio store. Um, but once a month, I used to close the shop and I would hold a workshop for hand tie bouquets, just simple. And I really enjoyed it. And so as my business developed, I was able to do a career change course for a lady who had been a head teacher at school and for various reasons came out of education and was looking for something more creative 
more mindful. So I was able to do a four week career change course just for her. And that gave me an insight into how I could help someone like make a real difference to their life. Mm -hmm. I am often told the courses are life changing as Stacy pointed out. Um, a couple of the students have said that to me this week and it isn't anything I do and it sounds very dramatic but I think for a lot of people it's having confidence, feeling empowered and I understood that that was something I could give. So from that point on I changed the business model and I launched Lily Rose Flower School not really knowing where it would go, not knowing that I would create this incredible community of Tallulahs who support each other, work with each other, um, lift each other up. I, did, I knew none of that, but I did really enjoy the teaching and the reward that that gave me. So that just took the business in the flower school direction and that was 15, 16 years ago. So yeah. Tallulah Rose, tell me the origin of that, of that name. It's very sweet. Okay. So, um, back when the business was launching or the flower school was launching i um i was a, a birthing partner for a best friend back in the uk and her baby girl who i helped bring into the world in a very hand-holding kind of way was called india rose and she is now 20 and um i wanted to name it after her because my friend gave me a day course at Jane Packer in London so that's mm. kind of where the whole thing started mm. so I took Rose because obviously it was very relevant I didn't want to name it after her I didn't think that was fair so I actually landed on the name Lola and the reason was at, like if you could name yourself it was kind of like I would name myself something a bit more sassy than Rachel <laughs> and I liked the name Lola but unfortunately at the time there was uh, a jewellery brand which is is still in existence called Lola Rose. So if you searched Google, like Lola Rose jewellery would just come up. So my yeah. husband said to me, well you can't have that name. And this was before social media. Um, and I was, what do you mean I can't have it? And I'd set my heart on it. And he's like, no one will ever find you. So Tallulah was born out of uh, seeking something, an alternative to Lola. And actually, I think Tallulah works. I think you, I think you landed on the yeah. right name. So it was a happy because happy you want to hang out with someone named Tallulah because she's yes. a lot of fun. Exactly. You exactly. don't know what's coming next because yep. she could have something up her sleeve that is really crazy. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> but she's but it's sol a solid name too. Yeah, and people like to say it, and it works. You know, people uh, students graduate; they are uh, Tallulah. Yes, I picked up on that. Yeah. Tallulahs mm -hmm. are your alumni. Yeah. I love that. So Stacy's a Tallulah now. Mm -hmm. I, I think there was one participant who asked prematurely yes. on Thursday, can we call ourselves Tallulahs <laughs> now? And Rachel's like, we need to mm -hmm. wait until Friday. <laughs> I often find when people have <laughs> women's names in their business that um, they get called that as well. Oh, yeah. I'm so I'm sure Tallulah. people think that your name is Tallulah. Mm -hmm. um, how did the two of you connect and meet then? I mean, a, an ocean away. Um, how did this come about? And we'll talk a little bit about the structure of the course um, after this. Instagram. Instagram, okay. Mm -hmm. So I've spoken about this a few times this week. We've talked about Instagram and uh, the algorithms of being on that social platform. And one of the absolute benefits is connecting with people from all over the world. And I had an idea that I wanted to come to the States. I get a lot of students over in the UK from the States because there isn't anything quite like Tallulah Rose here. So I thought actually I want to go to the States and um, take myself to people that couldn't come to the UK. Right. And Travel knew, to the students in yeah, a way. Yeah. yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to be on a flower farm and other than that it was Instagram. So I searched and found Stacy and sent a random message I don't even know what time of day it would have landed with Stacy but just sent a message and said I've got this idea and that was in 2023 you started planning or it must have been yes yeah 
Um, what were your, what was your criteria other than being on a flower farm? Do you wanted to obviously be in a place that you could have a, a ideal group number? You said you had eighteen students in the school this past week, mm -hmm. right? Um, it was about the person. And mm -hmm. Stacy asked me last weekend. I can't remember how you phrased it. It was like I want to ask this question. I almost don't want to know the answer. But um, Stacy said, "Why did you choose me?" And because there are other flower growers sure. on and maybe I'm sure a you bigger scale, and you s considered others too, probably. Did you look at others? Um, I did, but as soon as Stacy and I connected, I knew this was the right one. And I didn't know at that point. I didn't really know the scale. I would have worked with whatever scale. So if we'd have had to reduce numbers to six, I would have worked with six. It wasn't about I want this big group. It wasn't about scale. It was about Stacy. About the fit. Yeah. About the fit. Wonderful. Um, and when you teach in um, uh, uh, Cumbria, where you are now, mm -hmm. what is the what is the venue that you're t typically teaching at? Is it at your st your studio at yeah. that location? So I have um, a beautiful renovated old stable on um, um, a 16th century estate uh, with a deer park. It's beautiful. It's very different to this. We often don't see the sunshine like this. Um, but it's a beautiful space. It's very calm. It's very cool. Um, I usually typically have classes sort of 8 to 12, so smaller um, than this week. Are they usually five days? Um, I run anything from four weeks to one day. Oh, I see. So, so some of them are the more of the career change yeah. courses. Okay. Yeah. yeah, three to one day workshops. Yeah. yeah. What did you call this workshop that just took place here at, at Petal and Pitchfork? Floral immersion. Okay. We use that term a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's, it covers so much, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, absolutely. It could be personal or professional. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it sounds like, Stacy, it was the same for you that you just felt some kind of connection with this woman across you know across the globe who you only knew through social media or kind of a cold call in a way how, how did it evolve into you saying yes and and you hosting this um well so rachel and i have talked about um how we are both inclined to um really push ourselves to grow mm -hmm. I mean, growth as, you know, as people in right. our industry. Go beyond the boundaries. Yes. Yeah. And um, for me, being able to do that within the context of Rachel's trust has been phenomenal. Mm. And so, you know, when, so we started having email exchanges. So there was the initial, you know, sort of get to know somebody on an email platform. Sure. And, um, you know, I, I tend to have a, a a pretty good sense you know I've been on the planet long enough and I'm a I'm a collaborator I'm yeah. a community builder and so I had such a great sense of who Rachel was as a human um, as an individual and then as a professional through those exchanges you know as we worked out details as we asked each other questions and um, it did not take very long at all for it to become clear that it was such a beautiful fit, and I've told her repeatedly how grateful that I am that she found me. Mm. Mm. That's wonderful. Have you done workshops here at Pedal and Pitchfork in the in the past? Um, I know you've done, like you said, dinners and that sort of thing. Yeah. So one of the reasons we purchased these 15 acres was to share it with community mm -hmm. you know when we moved off of bainbridge island you know we've been in in kitsap county for 24 years so we've lived in indiana bainbridge island indianola for eight years bainbridge island again and when we moved off of bainbridge island we were looking for an acre or two to grow some food to grow some flowers to share it with our extended family friends and this historic 15 acres um, came on the market at that exact same time. And the barn is on the historic register. The barn and the house were built in 1903. And all of the old timers who live around us have stories um, mm -hmm. of this place. And having grown up in on my mother's side of the family are farmers. And I, I grew up running through cornfields, sitting at the front of the combine, um, 
you know, mucking through streams, eating from my parents' you know, acreage, my mom preserved, and um, they grew a lot of food. This, this is greatly appealing mm-hmm. and a, a beautiful place to be able to not only raise our son, but then to share with community. Um, and so the, that community piece is something I might come back to time and time again, because um, that's what I sensed in Rachel also, was that for her, it was important to not necessarily highlight herself, but through herself as a, as a conduit, as a professional, to highlight the capacities of others. Um, and that felt like a really strong and important connection um, because this, this to me wasn't, um, it wasn't about pedal and pitchfork. It was about what Rachel brought to it, of course, what my family brought to it, but then what each of the participants brought to it, which what each of the growers who contributed their stems in this, from this area, this beautiful area of Kitsap where there are a lot of flower growers, there are more flower growers, you know, all the time, what they brought with such heart and passion. Um, and so there was that alignment for Rachel and I also. Um, and out of that has, has become I don't, this budding, beautiful friendship that mm-hmm. I'm really grateful for. Mm-hmm. And now I can say that I have a mentor, you know, mm-hmm. I can say that I have learned um, I have learned floristry in a, a professional setting within a, you know, within a, a framework that gives me the tools, you know, even like the subtleties of, um, you know, I watched Rachel wire for a boutonniere yesterday, you know, and, and my, her fine motor skills compared to my fine motor skills, but, you know, she taught us you know certain certain techniques throughout the week that you you don't get when um especially as a grower as a grower and a right. florist right. you don't have time mm. right um so anyway i feel like that there was great resonance and um it just um like i said i knew early on that it was a great that's fit. lovely mm-hmm. um we've talked a little bit about stacy's path to flowers i know there's more but um rachel talk a little bit about your path to flowers what 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 did you do before you touched flowers or have you always touched flowers no not at all i was a fashion buyer before flowers so i used to buy handbags and jewelry still do um but yeah i used to work for big organizations back in the uk big high street and i loved it i moved to london when i was 21 um, from the north of england and i loved fashion i was beside myself to be in that environment. Um, so I was in buying um, for quite a number of years and it was when my husband and I decided to leave London that my options for pa- fashion buying uh, were greatly reduced. Sure. So I made that decision um, around, well, the story about being a birthing partner for my best friend, that coincided. So I went to Jane Packer and I did a day course. And you're saying and Jane Packer had, she's like an iconic yes. florist in London yes. and has done books and had a school. Absolutely. May, may, may still have a school, I'm not sure. Um, she does, uh, sadly, um, Jane Packer passed away a few years ago, okay. but her business is still run by her husband, okay. um, as far as I know, but yeah, still very much there. So I did the day course and I think I, I loved it for, um, I think I must be quite an impatient person because at the same time I was doing a millinery course fashion college just evening course and I loved absolutely loved but being able to create something from like a bucket of flowers within minutes essentially really gave me a buzz um, as opposed to stitching tiny yeah. needle and uh, my background's yeah. textile so I know yeah. like the the labor intensive millinery yeah. work exactly you yeah, were too hard. impatient yeah I love yeah, that I think yeah um, and I remember leaving Jane Packer with two hand tied bouquets in flower bags walking down Marlborough High Street and just noticing people's smiles and I obviously wanted to turn around and say hey I made these yeah look at me um, I didn't but it was that appreciation of uh, the joy that they brought to people which I hadn't really had not really realized before and um, so that was the start of it. Mm-hmm. So when Martin and I, my husband, we decided that's it, we're leaving London. 
I went back to Jane Packer and I did her four week career change course. Oh, okay. Um, so I think, you know, I, I hadn't never been like a lifelong, you know, wish to work with flowers. My mom and dad had a beautiful garden and it was always very neat, very floral. So I'd kind of been brought up around flowers, but there was never a like, oh, this is what I really want to do. But as soon as I started it, then I was bitten by the bug. It for became sure. your medium. Yeah. I love that. That's mm. wonderful. And um, your studio, what was the pre previous name before the Tallulah Rose name was created? So uh, the shop was Rachel Lilly, which was my uh, maiden name. Um, so I was married at the time, but I kept, uh, I chose my maiden name, wow. obviously. Because Rachel it, Lilly to Tallulah Rose. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> Got a cute know. botanical reference. <laughs> I know. One of the things I was, I'm most curious to hear you talk a little bit about, just also in kind of context with what's happening in the UK and Europe, um, is the introduction of the sustainability um, dialogue and conversation in your in your curriculum. Um, how did that evolve, and how what has the response been? Um, because you know, there's every type of floral design ed educator and instruction that is available, including very very conventional, non-sustainable mm -hmm. yeah. um, models. So how do you break through and, and make this uh, elevated so it's important to people? I think uh, for my business, as soon as it became apparent that floral foam was evil, um, we stopped using it. Mm -hmm. So when I relocated, so it was around, uh, stopped using it uh, probably around 2018. And when I relocated to Cumbria, that was the moment that I chose to really highlight the fact that we no longer talk with foam. Um, I'd already worked with local growers back in the Southwest. There were some great growers around Bath. Um, so for me, it was just showing people um, what's available. Because I think a lot of people, certainly in the UK, it sounds a bit bizarre to say, but I don't think they even think about where flowers come from. Right. And I, I think we are, not in our circles or my circle because I'm working with people that are passionate about flowers. But I think if you took an average person, they buy flowers to say sorry, to say thank you, birthday. It's not, um, you know, in Europe, no one would dream of going anywhere to anyone's home without taking flowers and it's just not the same in the UK. Yeah, for me, it's about showing um, what is available and highlighting growers you yeah. know and what, and, and what they're doing and uh, leading by example yeah. you know I have uh, students that come to school who are career changing and they may never have picked up a piece of foam which is pure bliss because they will never do so you because, don't have to unteach them no exactly <laughs> right but then I do get students who have been in the business for a long long time and are nervous um, to create without using foam mm -hmm. because that's all they've ever known mm -hmm. and I really admire them that they are, are putting themselves in quite an uncomfortable position to actually come and unlearn um, yeah it's lead by example yeah for sure one of the things that um, we talked about before we started recording was just how the workshop the last five days the structure went and you showed me some of the installations of course they're foam free but um, maybe, I don't know, Stacey, I'll let you, you start and then we'll bounce um, to Rachel. Sort of walk me through how the structure of this five days in floral immersion mm -hmm. took place. Because sustainability and seasonality mm -hmm. were deeply involved in everything, but mm -hmm. also the personal, um, sort of personal floral aesthetic. People were not just copying what Rachel taught. They mm -hmm. were being encouraged to, to discover their own aesthetic. Yeah, so one of the many things that I appreciated about this um, this whole experience was, um, you know, the, the opportunity as a grower to grow what I love. And um, Rachel never set out a formula. There was never um, anything from her where she said, this is what I need you to grow for me. Um, and that just that in and of itself is so incredibly empowering. Um, and there's a lot of learning that goes al along with that. Um, and that, you know, that for me is where I want to be. I want to grow the majority of the stems that I use. Mm -hmm. That's important to me. 
Um, and so over the course of um, the five days, in terms of, of how it unfolded, um, you know, I would, so when Rachel arrived, the cooler was full. Um, we had just had that heat wave. And so I was, was madly out in the fields, um, picking things that I knew would be, you know, far, far past if I left them in the field. The other, you know, piece that was so wonderful for me is that I love to use, and I know many designers love to use too, things that are nearly at that stage where they're blown, mm -hmm. you know, where they're really expressive. And being, again, in situ allowed us as much as possible um, to be able to do that. Um, you know, the things that Rachel would harvest or, you know, forage or whatever, you know, literally was cut the day before the morning of. and. Um, similarly, you know, at night I would harvest, fill up, you know, since the walk-in cooler was full, fill up the floor, part of the floor of the barn, um, you know, the next morning harvest things I, I knew didn't need a lot of conditioning and so um, would bring those up as well. And so each day we started to find our flow mm -hmm. um, really early on, really the first day. And then from the selection in the walk-in cooler and what was on the barn floor and then whatever Rachel wanted to forage. Um, she would select each day the elements that um, she wanted us to have the opportunity to work from, mm -hmm. work with. And um, there were also obviously, as I've mentioned, you know, stems that came in from um, other growers. You know, we had some supplementation of dahlias and we had some beautiful amaranth and some zinnias. I mean, because for us, early, early July is early for those things. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and so Sunday was a beautiful day when mm -hmm. we had all of these deliveries. Um, and then there was Amy from Forest Elf Farm in Port Townsend who grows the most magnificent roses, who came with bucketfuls of, um, because ro the rose is not something I grow as a cut. Right. Um, we grow it around the farm as an ornamental. Um, and so that was, I think for yeah. me, one of the highlights too. Sunday, um, the growers being able to meet Rachel and, and her, her, not just the graciousness, but um, the way in which she honored each of those growers, their efforts and acknowledged these stems that were freshly cut and came from, you know, local, local farms. I mean, that, that's huge. It's absolutely huge. And then Rachel, your little brain was working on overtime thinking, okay, what day will I teach this yep. technique? And then how will I, what flowers do I want to use? Like, did you have a particular um, a mechanic or style that you were trying to just uh, 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 dive into each day. I, I saw a lot of people posting yeah. hand tie bouquets and sympathy uh, arrangements, and there were certain topics that yeah. you covered, right? Yeah. So I knew um, ahead of, like I've been planning for the last few weeks with the experience when I teach back at home. What's the the best way to start and throwing someone into a big in installation on the first day is not the right way to to do things so so on the first day I well actually the first morning of the first day we had um, introductions so I sort of set the scene I gave a bit of background into uh, Tallulah Rose I cried um, introduced Stacy cried um, it was very emotional um, but then the amazing thing for me is to listen to each and every one, uh, to hear their story of what brought them here, or I always ask, you know, what people are excited about, what are they fearful about. It's good for me to get a handle on straight away if somebody is anxious about something because I can set their mind at rest from day one. I don't want them to be anxious about something that isn't going to happen for two days, you know. Um, and then we created bowls, which I find is a, a relaxing first design to do because it's not hand tie bouquet, people stressing, hands are like, Ugh. so, um, and I think really for the first day, it was helping students understand that this was going to be a joyful experience, that they didn't have to be worried, um, that I was open to questions you know the the right level of um, relaxing yes we're all here to learn and we're not just going to float around for a week um, 
so they understand and kind of find uh, relax themselves because I think yeah. people learn better yeah. that way um, and basically as the week uh, went on not necessarily got more complicated but we certainly kind of increased in scale yes um, which ended on Thursday with the large-scale installation and then Friday we kind of took it back down a little bit and made went back to making individual pieces we created an amazing tablescape we all sat for lunch together um, and then the final thing was the flower crowns and that was a lot of fun um, I demonstrated more traditional wiring but I knew in terms of the heat and people's level of energy would not uh, I didn't want them to leave on like a ah this is you know too much so we sure. created a, a, a much simpler flower crown and I think everyone's character was reflected mm -hmm. in their crown and everyone saw that of each other so it was a lot of laughs um, yeah a lot of fun it was a good way to, to end yeah and I and I know too that you know you don't know who your teacher that you haven't met before in this instance you know you don't know what their teaching style is and you don't know what their personality is and what their approach is and that first day was perfect because Rachel gave space for everyone to talk about themselves and I think that that's important space you know why I mean, you didn't lay out, you know, bullet points, but, you know, people it sort of organically talked about why they were, why they were there, you know, of course, who and, and what they do um, for a living. And, um, but then over the course of the, you know, the day, people started to understand who Rachel is. And, you know, she was talking about, you know, choosing Puddle and Pitchfork, our farm, um, based on the connection that we had on social media. But people relaxed into the course and were better learners and more comfortable because of who Rachel is. And that happened the first day. And then you could see over the course of the rest of the four days that just, you know, I mean, there's no, no judgment. I mean, right. people don't want to be judged when they're, when they're learning. You created you know? a trust, an environmental, mm -hmm environment of trust for everybody yeah and yeah. like Rachel was saying by you know yesterday all these you know conversations going on while the hanging installation was being done and then laughter with the flower crowns and you know photos and um, and then so many tears when people left yesterday mm -hmm. it took a long time for people to leave the farm yesterday <laughs> that's not a that's a great that thing but good. all the goodbyes and it was powerful mm -hmm. it really was I'm so I'm so happy for you I watched vicariously and I think it was good that I came today mm -hmm. when all the you know dust has settled and yeah. you had a little bit of time to reflect yeah. and um, I know we're we're going to hopefully show some photos from the workshop in our show notes um, just to give a flavor of this and also before we wrap up I just kind of like to have you both talk about what what are you inspired to do next um, I think we, we, we do a lot of dreaming and fantasizing while our hands are busy. That's why I love to garden and weed because it frees my brain up yes. to think of yeah. things that I've subconsciously been gnawing at. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you both, either of you had that experience mm -hmm. that you're, we both alluded to maybe uh, a new f next project or a continuation of something that started here. Mm, I, I already know. I'm sure Rachel does too, but I, you know, I, um, so again, the, the community and the collaboration piece, you know, the community of growers here is really important. And, you know, there's, there's the, the phrase, the rising tide lifts all the boats. And um, what I love is, is I have the opportunity to collaborate and learn from a couple of, of local people, you know, collaboration on an installation in, in early August and um, help with a big wedding that I have in August and taking what Rachel has has taught us provided space for us to learn um, is so exciting for me as a grower it's really I have not afforded myself that time so um, next week is this coming week is my birthday and I have given myself the, the whole week and then some to go out into those full fields and practice and, and that's one of the things too that I've learned is so important 
is just that muscle memory and practice, practice, you know, understand your flowers. And to be able to do that as a grower on the heels of um, what we've learned from Rachel, oh, huge. All right, yeah. I love that. I love that a lot. How about you, Rachel? Well, I, uh, I would, I, I loved doing this. Yeah. I absolutely loved it. Um, it's a real open. affirmation that you are you can leave the UK yeah. and, and travel yeah. then, right? Yeah, and I think it became apparent very quickly that I had new things to be able to teach. Um, and that I, for me, I guess, one of my worries was that I, I knew what I could bring to someone. Um, but I guess there was part of me was, am I bringing the right thing? Am I teaching the right thing? And personally, it became apparent very quickly that yes, I, I, I could do that. And obviously being in uh, this, w with this backdrop, being with Stacy you know, for me was a dream come true to be able to do a course, um, you know, where the flowers are grown. So I would like to do more of that. Yes. So for that. next year, 2025, I have committed to working only with British flowers. And that has been about three years in the planning because it's not something I could do overnight. My courses are scheduled a year in advance and I had scheduled courses out of the British growing season and people had already booked, so they were committed. Sure. So for 2025, the courses are running within the British growing season. So I've, I'm making a statement in terms of um, my commitment to it, my commitment to my growers. And we've had, you know, the last two years of working very closely. I have about nine growers that I work with, some bigger, some smaller. So we know, we all know that this is where we're aiming for next year um, and it, it's made them um, think about what they can grow early and obviously, you know, as far into the season as possible. So that's my commitment um, to show what we can create just using British. But also, as aside from that, I'm still continuing to work with um, an importer because I appreciate that lots of my students need to import flowers at certain times of year and they may commit to British when they can but they do also have to um, import. So for me I guess a, a personal, a real sort of um, personal push is to highlight to our importers that we need as much information as we can so that we can make informed buying decisions because a student you know may come to me and say that I nearly I really need to import and I say that's fine you know we all do what we can do but if I can assure them that the wholesaler they choose doesn't work with a grower that isn't kind to staff that isn't taking water from you know or land that if we have that transparency then I I still want to offer that guidance to students that come so yes I'm all about the British and using locally grown but equally I'm not um, I'm not cutting off those that need to import flowers as well but you're using your voice to influence yeah. um, an industry that does it has not now always been transparent no. and that does have some improvement to do. Yeah. That's Absolutely. great. Yeah. Well, ladies, thank you so much. This has been such a joy and thank you. Thank um, you. the beginning of future conversations, I'm sure. But uh, I know this will be such a such a great focus on what happens when farmers and florists come together. That's really what Soul Flowers is all about. And you've embodied that in telling your stories. So I just want to thank you so much for a beautiful morning here at Petal and Fish Park. Thank you. Thank you. So you. Much. Thank you. Yeah.